the Holy Trinity. This has long been a source of confusion and uncertainty for Christian believers, and the subject is often avoided due to contentions caused by differing opinions. Many believers find it difficult to fully understand or explain it. It can be hard to clarify and support the concept of the Holy Trinity or Trium to someone in doubt or denial of its reality if you do not have a well-grounded knowledge of it yourself. This short study is intended to explain it to a level where your confusion is removed and you'll feel confident in your belief and being able to justify it in any conversation. The main contention and objection to the entity of the Trinity comes from the belief in the oneness of God. It is widely stated that there is only one God and that God has no partners or associates in his role as divine supreme being, which of course is true. The concept of the Trinity in no way challenges the oneness of God once it is understood completely and not misrepresented. The Bible states in many places that there is only one God. Isaiah 45 5 I am Jehovah. There is no other God. I alone am God. As we progress with this study, I hope that your mind will be open and you will arrive at a clear and complete understanding of the Trinity and prevent it from being a weak spot in your belief. Complete understanding of the Trinity and God is of course impossible for us limited mortal beings that we are. But God does not leave us stranded, however. He does want us to know Him, and He provides many clues to help us to come to an understanding. He tells us through the scriptures, Seek, and you will find. And for those who truly seek, the answers are there to be found. Firstly, we must establish exactly where did the idea of the Trinity come from? Was it an idea from man to make God look more mysterious? Or was it an idea from Satan to bring confusion and doubt and cause belief in God to fail? The main source of the Holy Trinity concept, as we will see, comes from the Bible. And we will first review these references and discuss them later. By starting in the Old Testament, the first reference we find is in the book of Genesis, which was written in Hebrew, and the word used for God is Elohim, which is a plural term meaning gods. During the translation to English, it was written in the singular form as God. In the story of creation, there is mention of God's Spirit brooding over the dark waters. And later, during the creation of mankind, it is written using the words us and our, which are plural terms. Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Isaiah also refers to God and His Spirit alluding to the idea that they are in some way separate. And now the Lord God and His Spirit have sent me. In the book of Samuel, he describes how God will finally establish His kingdom on earth by sending His agent from the seed of the house of David to do His bidding. The person He will send, however, will be no ordinary person, but will in fact 
be part of him. It will be his son. I will set up your seed after you, who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. Speaking in a personal or probing way about God, or even saying his name, was forbidden in the Old Testament days and may have restricted the prophets from analyzing him. The New Testament offers far more examples of the triune or trinity concept and refers to three facets or characteristics both individually and together as the combined entity of God. Several different terms are used to define each part of the Trinity, such as the Father being the first part, Son or Word as the second part, and Spirit, Holy Spirit and Comforter being the third part. These three entities of the Trinity or Godhead are spiritual and of a different realm to our own earthly nature and as such beyond our full understanding. By the fact of God having the power of creation displays the possession of qualities that we can never analyze or explain. Oh, the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable! are his judgments and his ways past finding out. John speaks plainly about the three entities individually and also as being part of each other, as being one. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. This concept is made further from our understanding by the fact that God is able to send part of the Trinity to our realm in the form of flesh. And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. All of the three facets of the Trinity were displayed in the baptism of Christ at the hands of John the Baptist. First, of course, there was Jesus himself. Then the Holy Spirit was seen descending down to Jesus in the form of a dove. Then the voice of God the Father was heard as he spoke to the people, saying, This is my Son, of whom I am well pleased. By only these few examples, we can see the concept of the Trinity or Godhead and that it originated in the scriptures of the Bible. By reviewing more examples from the scriptures, we can discern the nature of each part of the Trinity and their relationship with each other. Whilst this three-in-one concept may seem at first complicated and problematic, it will be seen to be simple and easily understood as we progress. The references to entities of the Trinity found in the scriptures reveal an order or hierarchy where the Father is the controlling or dominant part of the union. Jesus, the embodiment of the Word, stated that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. God called Christ his Son. He called him Lord and said that he, Jesus, had created all things in heaven and on earth. 
Jesus always maintained that he was acting only on the orders of the Father and that everything he said and spoke were the ideas and thoughts of the Father and not his own. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will but the will of him who sent me. I am not teaching you my thoughts but those of God who sent me. He who believes in me believes not in me but in him who sent me. And he who sees me sees him who sent me. For I have not spoken on my own authority but the Father who sent me gave me a command, what I should say and what I should speak. These examples display the direct link between the two, the Father and Jesus, that one may act for the other. Jesus plainly states that he is God by describing himself as the I am, which was the Hebrew term for God. Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Paul repeated John's sentiments when he wrote, Christ is the exact likeness or image of the invisible God. By him all things were created. He is before all things. This interconnection shows that Christ is part of God. He had to be to be the creator. If it were not so, then he would only be a creature. So far, we have looked mainly at the parts that God the Father and the Son play in the trium. They are well documented and can be understood. The role of the Spirit, however, is more complex and is to some more difficult to understand. The Holy Spirit does not follow simple logic and is related to the personality and character of God and acts as a controlling and reflective influence. This extra facet of God is the third part of the Godhead, which is the Holy Spirit and really is the essence and personality of God. Don't forget that God is self-sustaining. He has no direct need of us or anything else. The third quality of God is really the pure, selfless, true love that God alone can attain. God does not just act with love. God is love itself. And this is the quality we receive when we accept God and the Spirit and we change our lives for the better. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. Jesus referred directly to all three attributes of God when he gave his final instructions to his disciples before his ascension. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Jesus promised to send this Spirit of Truth to those who believe after his ascension in the form of a helper or comforter. But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. These examples are enough for us to know the origin and the nature of the Godhead Trinity, and that it originated from Scripture, which is God's way of communicating with us. The references are there, they cannot be unwritten, and they have established that the Trinity has a three-in-one concept of the three main attributes of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They are often displayed in symbolic form to help us visualize this concept.
we see that whilst each attribute is separate in nature, they are not separate individuals, but they are one entity known as God. The Trinity concept is established and yet so many people will say, how can this be? And many will still say, no, this is wrong. God is one person. The idea of the Trinity may seem a big step and complication from the one God concept. But let us look at this in perspective. The divine entity of God is so complex that with a single word of be, he can create a living being or physical object. Can we ever understand that? God is so complex that he is omniscient. He knows all things that there is to be known, including our thoughts and motives. God is so complex that he is omnipresent. He is present everywhere, in all places that exist, all at the same time. When you consider that all things exist through his presence, then why would he not be part of everything he created? This attribute of being everywhere is again beyond our understanding and the limitations of being one single person as we understand it. If we look at the whole picture and immensity of God and then compare it with the Trinity concept, does the Trinity still look complicated or is it an oversimplification of God? We must never be tempted to try and reduce the size and complexity of God and shrink it down to a size that fits into our very limited understanding. We can never understand God fully and anyone who pretends to understand God is fooling himself. To try and gain an understanding of God, we can only follow the clues that have been given to us and that God has provided to help us seek and find the answer. We must look carefully at exactly what God says. In the story of creation, God said that he created man in his own image or likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Right there we have our first clue of what God is like. As if we are an image or copy, then we must have some similar attributes as him. Don't forget that an image or copy cannot be identical to the original. It will always be inferior in some way. It will, however, give a general representation of the original. God is asking us to use common logic and if we look deeply at man we can arrive at some understanding of this trio that confounds so many people and yet is so obvious. I am not being so disrespectful as to say that we are just like God but I am using the clue given in the scriptures to help you to visualize the concept more easily. As a person, we are comprised of three different elements that are individual in their nature and yet part of each other and forming the whole person, the one. Each part is dependent on the other to enable a person to function correctly and together form the individual that you are. The way in which our own attributes are limited or can act independently of each other do not reflect the limitless nature and power of God the Creator who exists in dimensions we cannot perceive. The most obvious and apparent part of man is the physical body as this is the part that we can see and is the part that gets things done. Via the body the brain is able to put its thoughts into action. The body is what everyone sees, but it is not really you, the person. It is controlled by the unseen thought process from the brain that makes all the decisions and gives the instructions to the body to perform every function 
that takes place. The body is reliant on the brain and in some ways a servant of or lower than the brain. If we are to draw a comparison of man with God, then the body would equate to the Word, the Son, or Jesus, not only in his physical earthly incarnation, but also in his heavenly role as that of Creator. The entity of the Son manifests the thoughts and the wishes of the Father, putting them into action. No one knows or understands the dimension of the spiritual realm, and the Son is described in several ways as being the hand of God, the voice, and the word. Don't let us forget that we are created as an image or copy, and the parallel I have drawn is only to illustrate the various parts of the Trinity, and I am not suggesting that we are designed to be like God although we do serve as an example of the three-in-one concept. Both Jesus and Paul reinforced the concept of our body to be only one part of our being when they described it as a temple that housed the presence of God. Jesus said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells within you? The next part of man equating to the triune is the brain and its functions which are really twofold and bring us both of the remaining two parts of the triune. The basic and main part of the brain is the control center and is in charge of everything giving all the orders or instructions to the body for it to enact. Without the brain, the body is useless and can do nothing. And without the body, the brain too is powerless and ineffective. The brain can have a host of ideas and yet never be able to put them into action without the body. Even if only to speak and give instructions, it needs the body to convey them. When we talk of the brain, we are not really meaning the physical mass or flesh. We are really talking about the function performed and the thoughts and ideas contained or housed in its workings. This concept is difficult to grasp and in fact baffling to most people as it is invisible and beyond our understanding. This is how God is described as being without form, a present and force yet invisible. We can draw a parallel with this part of the brain as being the father, the controlling and motivating force responsible for all that happens. As seen earlier, Jesus always referred to the fact that he only did the things that the father told him to do. The last part of the triune that is represented in our comparison to man is the Holy Spirit, the mysterious entity that the scriptures describe as being like the wind, in that you cannot see it or know where it will blow, but you can feel its effects and know when you have been touched by it. So it is in the function of the brain as this part acts as the correcting influence that modifies the decision making in the main part of the brain and therefore the actions we make. These qualities we speak of consists of what we know as conscience being manifested as love, mercy, compassion, truth and pleasure and have been found to be located in the frontal lobe of the brain. We may first arrive at an instinctive response to a given situation and then modify our thoughts and actions based on one of these qualities. Our first reaction will most likely be to do what is in our best interest to survive or benefit regardless of the effect it has on other people. We may then decide to take an alternative course of action 
that will be more considerate to others, although it is not so beneficial to us or even harmful to ourselves. This quality is again difficult to understand and indeed spiritual in nature and is the attribute that separates our behavior from the instinctive reactions of the animals. This is the spiritual component which a person receives when they come to God and change their lives, often described as being born again after baptism. This entity is the divine quality or divine essence that flows from God and is the thing that puts him above all and perfect in every way. You can see from this simple comparison of ourselves that the three-in-one concept is possible and does exist. When you hear or read that there is only one God, do not be confused, just as there is only one you, and yet there are three parts to you, then so it is with God. Don't forget, however, that God is the almighty creator and from a different dimension to ourselves and has infinite boundaries to the qualities of his three attributes. God is not limited as we are and he can use his attributes in ways we cannot understand. He is and always was God the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Please don't let the triune concept be an obstacle or a stumbling block to your acceptance of God or progress along the path of faith. The clues are there for all if we only open our eyes and let God lead us. Have faith and trust in the Lord, he will never fail you.